Hi everyone, this is Sherry Wilson and I'm so glad to be with you today. We are at Beyond Hollywood Live Part 2, How to Walk by Faith. And I just want you to know how excited that I am to be able to come to you and share with you the things that I have learned. And I want to dedicate this show, this program, to my mom, Donna Perrone because she's the one that I watched and I watched her walk by faith and not by sight and I was able to see um, just how God can move in the midst of any situation that we may have. I know that there's going to be a lot of you asking questions and unfortunately I do not have a teleprompter <laughs> like I did when I was at Channel 65, but um, I will be answering your questions. Hi, Carla. <laughs> um, I just want to let you know that today's program is going to be fun. Um, there will be parts that I will be crying. Um, I want to also recap for you what we kind of went through last week. We talked about our timeline and how we know that our, that our steps are ordered by the Lord. And so I talked about the Three Stooges, and I talked about Larry Norman and my relationship with his family and his brother Charles. And um, today I'm going to go back to a time um, when I was eight years old. But the first thing I want to tell you is I've written down a bunch of scriptures. I hope you have your notebooks and your pen and paper because there's actually 65 verses on faith in the Bible. So I have jotted down a few of them so that you are able to read them on your own time. Make sure you cross-reference them. Um, when you cross-reference these scriptures that I'm giving you, it's going to take you on a treasure hunt and you're going to find that cross-reference and you're going to go to the next cross-reference and the next cross-reference and you are going to be finding hidden treasure. So in order for me to read, I have to put on cheater glasses. I have um, been in denial for the last 10 years that I needed to go to the optometrist. <laughs> so I visit the Dollar Tree and um, I've decided that when it's time for me to get glasses, uh, no, I will be wearing contacts because I look like a librarian, if you can believe it. Okay, so the first verse I want to talk about um, with walking by faith is Matthew 18.3. <clears throat> okay, here comes the glasses, guys. Truly, I say to you unless you turn and become like a child you will not enter the kingdom of God <clears throat> and the reason why I am reading that to you is because when I was eight years old um, we were living in Sunnyvale California there was um, somebody trying to break into our house and my mom was a single mom with three kids and I was laying in bed one night and in the 60s yes I was born in the 60s guys so um, in the 60s we used to have a valance on top of the window then the window would be open and then you'd have the curtains that hung down so you had this space of window where anybody could look in and out and one night I was laying in bed and I heard a noise outside and I actually thought that we were getting um, robbed again and so um, I noticed that my mom's bedroom light was on and I snuck out of bed real quietly and the way her room was there was you walked into her room and there was a, a wall so it would be like this and here was my mom's bed so I tucked my head around the corner, and here was my mom reading her Bible and praying. And every night before my mother goes to bed, 
She's reading her Bible. And I watched her and I learned from her. So I made my way back to my bedroom. I climbed in my bed and I was scared stiff. And I'm, I'm sure some of you know what that's like. You're laying in bed, you hear a noise, and all of a sudden you just can't move. You're frozen. And all of a sudden I looked up and my closet door had been open and I saw a vision of Jesus standing in my closet. Now this has happened to my mother as well. But Jesus was standing, his arms were open, his palms were faced toward me, and immediately this calm presence came over me. And about three weeks ago I was thinking about that when I was preparing to do this project. And the Lord said, Sherry, remember, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come to give life and life more abundant. And I thought, wow, what an awesome illustration that he would use that situation where I was afraid in bed because I heard a thief outside my window, but Jesus was standing in my closet giving me the peace and the comfort that I needed. So, with that being said, now I'm going to tell you a story. This is a true story. It will make some of you crack up. It will make some of you cry. Um, and I may start crying because you are going to watch God's hand move in such a miraculous way that there's no way you can deny that God still performs miracles today. When I was eight years old, as I told you, my mom raised three kids alone. And we, in the, in the late 60s, after the bills were paid, we had $14 left over for two weeks for food. And one day we sat down at the table and my mom served us three kids, a half a sandwich and a half a glass of milk. And she did without lunch. And my brother Scott was six years old and he looked at my mom and he said, Mom, I want some chocolate for my milk. I said, you do? And Scott said, yeah, I want chocolate. And my mom said, Evan, Evan, I get Evan and my brother mixed up all the time. So if I keep saying Evan when I'm talking in this story, no, I'm talking about my brother Scott. Okay. <laughs> so anyways, um, what happened was, is that Scott turned to my mom and he said, Mom, I need this chocolate milk. And my mom said, Scotty, if I had the money to go buy you chocolate milk, I would do that. But I do not have the money to do that. And see, Jesus in that verse that we just read, he tells us we're to come to him with the faith of a child. Think about how children are. They don't worry about anything. They go to school, they come home, they put on their play clothes, they ride their bikes, their scooters, their skates, playing basketball, baseball, and all they're doing is having fun. It's not until they get grown up where the burdens of responsibility choke out the fun that God wants us to have. And I think that's why he said, with faith as a child. And so... My mom, I'm sure, was sitting there thinking, okay, he's going to pray for chocolate milk. I don't have the money to buy chocolate milk. How can I explain this to this six-year-old little boy? Well, my brother prayed at the table, and he thanked God for the chocolate milk that he was going to have. And in the middle of his prayer, the doorbell rang. And I got up to answer the door. And here was the neighbor boy standing at the door with a two pound can of Nestle's Quick, and there was a note attached. Donna, I'm overstocked, can you use this? At the very moment that my brother Scott prayed, Jesus answered his prayer and he got his chocolate milk. See, Jesus knows our needs and our wants, but he wants us to come to him in prayer. And he wants us to ask with faith as a child. And that's why I wanted to share that story because it gets even more intense. I was eight at the time when this happened. And when I went into junior high, I went to Kennedy Junior High School. 
And when I went to junior high, I learned a lot of stuff about different ethnicities, um, the way people um, speak, the way people act, and I learned about the people to stay away from. And so one day I was sharing the story about the chocolate milk at school, and one of my friends, Diana, did not believe me. She said, you're lying. There is absolutely no way that God is going to provide chocolate milk for your brother. You are telling a lie. So Diana decided that I needed to be taught a lesson. So if you want to get an idea of what I looked like when I was in junior high, I was a bean pole. So take a stick figure, put blonde hair on it, and that was me. <laughs> so anyways... She goes to talk to Janice Gooch. I will never forget Janice's name. I will never forget that she was a big girl, big boned. And I tell you, Janice, if you're watching, I apologize for saying this, but she was one of those girls that could have played on the boys' football team and take everyone out. So the next thing I know is that I am finding out at the end of school that there's going to be a group that is going to beat me up when I get off the bus. So you can imagine what I was feeling inside, this fear I had inside of me, because I knew there's no way I'm going to make it with Janice Gooch if she, break, if she just hauls off and punches me in the eye. And she was known for fighting. And so I went home and I told my mom and I was afraid and, and said, Mom, they didn't believe the, the, the story. They didn't believe the miracle of the chocolate milk. And I don't understand it. And, you know, the Bible tells us that signs and wonders will follow them that believe. It's Mark 16, 17. And I just want you to know that I thought every Christian was experiencing miracles in their lives. I thought it was natural because I had watched how my mom had taught me through different situations, like with the chocolate milk, that God is our provider. And so I always thought, okay, this is this, you mean signs and wonders are going to follow. And yes, I may have a very, um, I may, may have a mantle from the Azusa Street Revival and Amy Simple McPherson that's passed down to our family. But you know what? Anybody can believe and then walk away. And the Bible says it's better to never have known the way than to know it and depart from it. And the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So gang, when God calls you and he's given you this gift... Don't let it go. There's too many people waiting. There are a lot of Janice Gooches out there. So here's the rest of the story. I go home and I tell my mom. So the next day I go to school knowing that when I get off the bus, I'm getting beat up. And I'm sitting on the bus and it pulls up to Ellis Elementary School where I used to attend. And I get off the bus and as soon as I take one step off that last step of the bus onto the sidewalk, around the corner comes my mom and Al Osuna, a family friend that you do not want to mess with. During that time, he was muscular, bald, or balding, and he just... He was just, they were just right there at the right time. It's like God just said, here's your angels, Sherry. Here's your protection. So we go on to the, to the um, um, blacktop where they had the tether balls. And if you guys know what tether balls are, I'm 55 years old. I didn't, don't even know if they still have tether balls at elementary school. But it's a ball that has a string on it connected to a pole and you hit the ball and you've got to wrap the ball around the pole but you've got a component so you've got to try to get the ball around 
the pole before they do. So we are standing next to the tetherballs. And we walk up, and here's Janice Gooch towering above every single junior high kid there. And Alasuna steps up and says, excuse me, but why do you want to beat up Sherry? Well, she's lying, Diana says. She's lying. She said that God provided chocolate milk for her brother, and we don't believe her. And my mom said, she is telling the truth. God did provide chocolate milk for her brother. And there was no need for a fight because these 20 kids got to hear the amazing story about God's loving mercy, about his provision, about his protection. <laughs> I could just imagine I was probably hiding behind my mom with my head sticking over probably looking at her but the next day I went to school and this was the most incredible thing and this is why I said I was gonna start crying kids knew Janice's reputation and Janice was in a different location of the of the school and people kept walking up at me to me looking for a black eye but they couldn't see a black eye and they're like wow I thought Janice was gonna beat her up yesterday what's going on why doesn't she have a black eye there's not any bruises on her she seems to be walking okay something's up so during lunch we all had to go into the quad and the yard duty teacher would walk around making sure that nobody was doing anything wrong and I walked into the quad and Janice was leaning against the pole and she calls me over next to her and I stood next to her and all of a sudden all of the picnic tables became empty as all the kids gathered around wondering where my black eye was and Janice stood up and she said Sherry was telling the truth God did provide chocolate milk for her brother she said Sherry and she helped me stand on the bench of a picnic table she said you need to tell them this story See, one person didn't believe me, called another person to beat me up. But God had a plan. He wanted these kids to know that Jesus is alive. Jesus loves us. Jesus wants to get the message out. And if we just have the faith to believe, we will see God's miracles happen. So here I stood up on the bench and I shared with everybody the story about how my brother had prayed. And that day, I went away thinking, wow, Jesus, what I thought was going to be destruction, what I thought was going to cause me pain, brought glory to God, brought glory to God. And I began as a kid watching miracles like this happen. Now, when I was eight, I'm going to go back because we used to go to Peninsula Bible Church and Ray Stedman was our pastor. And he was such a great Bible teacher. And we had Hal Lindsey was a regular there. And they also had what was called Body Life on Sunday nights. Now, if you can remember, we're in the 60s, so we got lots of hippies. We've got long hair. We've got baggy pants. We've got holes in our in our, our knees. We've got, well, they've got, I was eight. But these young adults have, um, you know, the vests on that have the leather straps that hang down. I mean, we're talking 60s, guys. Hate ashbury type 60s, okay? So what happens is... <clears throat> is that Ray Steadman and the staff at Peninsula Bible Church 
would pass the offering basket. And if anybody had a financial need, they were allowed to take up to $20 out of the offering basket. Now that is totally opposite from today. We tithe, we put our money into the basket, and it goes to help the church function. It helps missions. It helps the homeless. But I thought that it was so unique that Ray Steadman would have this type of a program for those that were really hurting. And so many people came to know Jesus. And I would watch. And I remember one Christmas when there wasn't enough money for Christmas gifts. And we were all little kids. My sister is five years younger than me, so she was three. I was eight, my brother was six. And my mom prayed, just like, she, just like my brother Scott, for the chocolate milk. And the next morning, my mom went out to the mail, and in the mailbox, there was a check for $500. Now, back in the 70s, that was a lot of money. And late 60s, that was a lot of money. But I want you to know something. My mom is a giver. And I've watched my mom give and give and give and give and give until she only had a few pennies to her, to her name. But I watched my mom spread the gospel through giving and loving people. And I can remember that she took that check and she gave to two other families that did not have money for gifts for their children for Christmas. I watched my mother pack up clothes that she would collect to send to Brother Abraham, who had like 17 kids in India, so that they would be able to have clothing and food and shoes. And one of the little girls in the family had prayed for a certain doll. And it just so happens that the last item packed in that box was a little doll. And it happened to be when they received the package in India that that doll was the very same doll she had in a dream. So Jesus was showing her and letting her see, come to me as a child come to me with faith and I am going to show you the manifestation of my presence so okay now I'm gonna put on um, my um, my cheater glasses again so I can read you these couple of these verses on faith but I also wanted to talk to you about a couple things. One of the things I want to talk to you about as you're going through your timeline, you're going to start seeing how little things come back to you, just like PBC, Peninsula Bible Church, and Ray Steadman with Body Life. Okay, that came back to me. Um, when I was eight years old um, at PBC, I would learn the Sunday school lesson, and in fifth grade, at lunch, I would take my Bible and my friends would all gather around me and we'd be sitting on the grass and I would be teaching them what I had learned at church. And so here I've got these kids my age that are, you know, learning Bible verses. We're sitting there reading the Bible and I'm teaching them. And it was just like God was saying, Sherry, this, this is what I have for you to do. I have taken you through some trials and tests, which you guys are going to hear about, because if you want to be used by God, I'm going to tell you right now, he's going to ask you a question. Are you willing to pay the price? There's a price to pay. There is a price to pay, especially when we go through the wilderness experience where we've got to be trained like Moses for 40 years with sheep. Jesus is going to train us. And the training comes from the Holy Spirit. 
And it says, when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So we know the Holy Spirit right then is fighting for us. He's disclosing to us so that we understand. The scripture says that they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And what did Jesus say? He told the disciples that when the spirit of truth comes, he will not speak on his own initiative, but what he hears, he will reveal to you what is to come. So I just want to let you know, um, yesterday we were supposed to do um, Hollywood Live, Beyond Hollywood Live, and I had to take my daughter to the hospital. I want to thank everybody from around the world that has been praying for her. She's doing so much better. I was going to go to the church today and use the church and have my little studio there, but I'm actually sitting in my living room of my condo and I made a makeshift studio so that I could come to you today because it has been a hectic couple days. My son Evan just got two jobs and he's working a night shift and a day shift and mom is tired. I'm not used to these night shift hours. So if I look a little winded, if I look a little tired, you will know that I need rest. <laughs> okay. So first of all, um, one of the things the Lord asked me, Sherry, will you offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable and pleasing unto me? And as I became an intercessor and a chaplain, I said, yes, Lord, I offer my body as a living sacrifice for you. For the price you paid for me, Jesus. I offer my body and the Holy Spirit said, will you make a vow to this? And I said, yes, Lord, I will make a vow. And so every test, every trial, everything that I am going to be sharing over the next several weeks, I'm going to walk you through. Because if you really want to be in God's end time army, What's the first thing that happens when a person joins the military? Now I'm going to look at these um, questions because as you see, God is connecting the dots. Thank, Car thank you, Carla. <laughs> um, what I want to, um, I want to find out if somebody knows what is the very, very first thing when you join the military that they make you do. Carla said, Okay, putting on the glasses. Look at your knee. Oh, look at my knee. I'm, we're talking about that later, Carla. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't see anybody that's given me an answer yet. But, yes, Carla, we will be talking about my knee, and he has used that in all capitals. Thank you, Carla, that I've gone through. And, yes, 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 yes. Boot camp, Carla says. Eh, wrong answer. Hey, you know what, you guys? I'm from the era behind me. Um, I don't know how many of you guys remember the gong show from the 70s. Carla, you just got gonged. <laughs> You're out of there, baby. Okay. The very first thing you do when you join the military is you take a test. How many of you know that? They need to know what are your skills? What are you good at? What are your high, what do you, what do you score high in? What are your, your you know, things that you maybe score low in? So they know exactly where to place you. So this is what you do. You take a test. So when we ask God and we say, God, yes, I want to join your end time army. I told you there's going to be a price. And I told you that it was going, you were going to go through trials. And um, I want to address something right now. I have people on my site from all over the world. 
And all week I have been thinking about Pastor Asif, A-S-I-F. He is from Pakistan. Pastor Asif, if you are with us, please, um, please acknowledge um, that you have joined on here because... God has really impressed upon my heart. You have exceeded um, what I would see as laying one's life down for the cross. You have gone from village to village in Pakistan preaching the gospel. You have led people to Jesus. You need Bibles. You need food for the sick. You need food for the homeless. And yet every time you step into a village, somebody could be there ready to take your life. And I just want you to know that I am praying for you. And I want everybody that's watching this, please pray for him. And for those of you that want to know how to contact him, I will give you his contact information and his Facebook page. He had shared with me that there was another pastor in a village that he could not tell me what had happened to them because it would put his life in jeopardy. That to me is laying your life down. Are you willing to pay the price no matter what the cost? Will you offer your body as a living sacrifice Pastor Asaph, that is what you are doing on a daily basis, and I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I cannot begin to tell you how much it has touched my heart that you are willing at any moment to be in the presence with Jesus because you are doing what he's called you to do. Okay, now I'm going to give you some verses on faith, but I have a quiz for you. Um, a year ago, January 2015, I wrote a friend a letter. And the question was, how many mustard seeds are in a 1.4 ounce bottle? Now, I did all my homework. I had all my figures, wrote it all out in the letter, and my computer broke. So my computer has all the details. So last night, as I was finishing up my notes, I went online. I thought I was going to be able to show you the picture of McCormick's little 1.4 mustard seeds. But I'm going to tell you right now, there are 2,010 mustard seeds in that bottle and I want to read to you a few of the Bible verses and I'm going to give these to you so you can start writing them down first Bible verse Matthew 18 3 was coming to him as a little child with childlike faith and then there's Mark 11 12 Hebrews 1.11 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. James 1.6 2 Corinthians 5.7 Hebrews 11.6 Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I just love that because you know what? If you think about that mustard seed, we are all given, all given faith. We are all given a portion of faith. So all of us have faith. When you sit down in a chair, do you think, is this chair going to hold me up? No, you sit down in the chair because you know the chair is going to hold you up. That's faith. So what? We're all given a measure of faith. And Jesus said, faith as a mustard seed could move a mountain. Could move a mountain. And you think, yeah, right, how can a little tiny mustard seed move a mountain? 
by the time I am done doing the series, you guys are going to know. Because when God provides, and God does a miracle, okay, like the chocolate milk. When you see God perform a miracle like that, what happens? That mustard seed starts to sprout. And all of a sudden you're like, okay, now I can't wait to see what God's going to do next. And you are anticipating. You're excited. You can't wait to see what he's going to do next. And that's why I talked about the dot and the line, the dot and the line, because everywhere there's a dot, God is building your faith, performing another miracle so that you will not be ashamed, but you will be bold. You will be a warrior. You will have your sword and shield. He will know what to do. And you will have such a, I pray over people, a bold, brazen. Brazen means tough, tough, tough spirit. A bold, brazen spirit. You are a tough person. You are a child of the king. We have been sent to make disciples. But what has happened in church today? And I know I'm jumping around, but the Holy Spirit, I asked him to speak through me. And so I'm just going as the Holy Spirit leads. So many churches today have got a schedule. They run by the clock. Okay? They say, okay, 30 minutes for, um, 15 minutes for music, 30 minutes for a sermon. We're going to close the sermon, and we're going to have refreshments in the back, and you can socialize with your friends. When I was in high school, and I would go to church, we would have the music, we would have the sermon, and then we would have an altar call. Do you know that people that are going to many traditional churches right now, they've totally cut the Holy Spirit out of their sermons, out of their church doctrine? And it is so sad because that's Satan's biggest lie to the church. That the gifts ended with the disciples. But my Bible tells me that my Jesus, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he does not change. And if ever we needed the power of the Holy Spirit, it is now in our day and age. And God said he is raising up a remnant. And the latter rain will be stronger than the first. And the old wine cannot handle the new wines, the new wine skins. The old wine can't handle the new wine skins. We need a new wine. And that new wine is being built up in people that you have turned your backs on. You drive by, you see someone with a sign, they say, I'm homeless, I'm hungry. And you mumble to yourself, I'll go, just go get a job. And you drive off. How do you know that's not an angel there testing you to see what you're going to do? I have seen drug addicts in my neighborhood been on methamphetamines for 15 years and I'm going to bring Alicia on my show probably next week or maybe in a couple days and we're going to share her story she's 15 years old she is staying with me right now she was in juvenile hall and became a Christian and came to my house crying asking if she could pray with me because she was worried about her mom and she wanted her mom to know Jesus like she knew Jesus. And I heard this little girl pray and I stopped her. I said, Alicia, how did you learn to pray like that? She said, I learned it in juvenile hall. I said, honey, you have such a tender heart for Jesus. And she goes, yeah, but I'm being pulled by my peers. 
and I am pulled by my faith, but I love Jesus so much that I don't want to go that road any longer. Well, her probation officer came over because for right now her parents are in transition. And he said, I know you're a chaplain. I know you're on disability because of your knee, but she needs a permanent address right now. Can she stay with you? I said, absolutely. Absolutely she can stay with me. And I have been watching her. She came with me to the hospital to see my daughter. She has been learning things that she would not learned before. She's been talking to me so much about Jesus. And we are going to talk about her mom. Her mom did get delivered in one moment, 15 years, every day on meth. And God delivered her. And not only did he deliver her, but she got saved as well. So we're going to go into that story and we're going to talk about that in a couple weeks because I have a tendency to jump ahead and I do not know how much time I have left. Carla, do you have an idea how much time I have left? Um, all I see is a two next to live. So if you can let me know um, how much time I have because I have a very, very funny story after we talk about faith. I'm gonna, I want to talk to you something about the Beatles and um, also last night I was supposed to go pray with the, the church and we were going to go into the, the downtown Old Town Roseville and pray for those in need and we had such an awesome time yesterday but I got home late from the hospital and um, stopped by Evan's work and I met Erica. I'm saying a shout out to you. I promised you I would. I shout out to Erica. Jesus loves you so much. And I thank you for what you said. There was a young girl sitting down, probably in her late 20s. And we just started talking about Jesus. And everybody around her left. And it was just her and I on the sidewalk on the steps of 7-Eleven. And she cried and I prayed with her and she cried some more and she hugged me some more and then she started watching last week's um, part one and then she looked at me and she said you know thank heaven for 7-eleven I thought that was the best line ever so see my steps were ordered I was still supposed to pray for somebody last night Erica I love you, sweetheart. Stay strong. Read your Bible. You've got me on Facebook, so you've got questions. Shoot them over. Okay, so let's finish with these faith. Faith, I, uh, I've been on for 43 minutes. Okay, you guys, it's 60 minutes is when my, my show is up, so if somebody could let me know when it gets down to be five minutes, I sure would appreciate it. I do not have a director in front of me nor do I have my teleprompter, so I don't have anybody to tell me, cut, <laughs> except for Carla, which you guys are going to hear about Carla's story too, because Carla and I became friends over Facebook, and we became friends through prayer and intercession, and you're going to hear her story, and we're going to try to figure out how we can link it up to where you can hear her speaking when I'm speaking and so that you can hear her. We don't know quite how to do that with this new Facebook Live, but the, ne the next um, thing I want to talk about is 2 Corinthians 5, 7 is another um, scripture on faith. I already read to you Hebrews 11, 6, which without faith it's impossible to please God. James 1, 3. Romans 14, 1. If I'm going too fast, let me know. Mark 10:52 Mark 9:23 First Corinthians 13:13 13, 13, Galatians 2:20 And I have put a star next to this one Matthew 17:20 Faith as a mustard seed because you have so little faith truly I tell you 
If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this tree, be uprooted and planted into the sea, and it will obey you. So I had a mentor who didn't know he was my mentor, and through everything that happened that you guys are going to hear about, how I got into Hollywood and how I ended up at CBS um, promoting um, this present darkness script. Um, you're going to hear all about that and um, what happened um, when I went to um, see Tim's story for the very first time. And I'm going to share this story because I want you to know that my dad's side of the family is Nazarene. My mom's side of the family is charismatic. Um, like you know, my mom's side was at Azusa Street and Amy Simple McPherson. And on my dad's side, you guys don't know this, but my great grandfather in 1935 was the chaplain at San Quentin. So, you know what? We have a lot of people in my neighborhood. We have trap houses here where people come to buy drugs. And Jesus brought me here. I mean, you talk about prosper where you're planted. The day I moved into this condo, somebody took a piece of chalk and wrote under the bumper of the U-Haul, Jesus, heart you. I walked into the condo and I said, uh, excuse me, kids, um, but who wrote underneath the bumper, Jesus, heart you, Jesus loves you, nobody wrote it. God's fingerprint was saying, Sherry, this is where I need you to be. So um, my son Evan's a rapper, and he wrote a song called Trap House. It's Evan Wilson. He's on um, YouTube. You can listen to that. But God has been having me. This is my mission field. I have people, in fact, there was a guy that came over here the other day talking to me outside. He had been in prison for 27 years. He's been out for three years. Do I know what he was in there for? No. Do I need to know? No. And he said, where's the church lady? He calls me the church lady. I need some questions answered. See, he got saved in prison. But he knows his Bible because he's been reading it. So I just want you to know something. There are probably about six men and women in my, my, within walking distance of my house that have been to prison. My next door neighbor is a pastor. And he was going to go to prison for attempted murder. But Jesus changed everything. See, you've got to remember something. When you look at someone who's gone to prison or gone to jail, or they've made a poor choice or decision, or some circumstance put them there, you're forgetting one thing. And that is that in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, spent a lot of his time in prison. I do not think that you would treat the Apostle Paul the way you treat some of these people that have been in prison or are now out. See, faith, hope, and love, the way they are going to come to Jesus is not through condemnation, not through judgment, they're going to come to him because you're coming to them with love. You're talking about the love of Jesus. So Tim's story, I'm going to quote you right now. Jesus made some people mad. He made some people malfunction. And he made a whole lot of people marvel. And I'll tell you, everybody here in my neighborhood, they know who I am. They know I pray. They have, they have been healed out in front of my porch. Some guy couldn't raise his hands above his head. I prayed for him. He stuck his head, hands straight up in the air. Jesus said he had a problem with Achilles tendon. I prayed. This kid was walking back and forth and said, I don't have any pain. So I said, who healed you? 
Marquise, who healed you? He goes, uh, I said, who healed you? He said, Jesus healed me. I said, that's right. Jesus healed you. I'm just the vessel. I'm just the conduit. Jesus gets the glory. Jesus gets the glory. He's glorified. He is glorified. I will stop in my car. I will see someone walking with a cane or in a wheelchair. And I will say, hey, what's going on? Can I pray for you? In the 15 years I've been praying for people, I've never had anyone say no. So, a miracle. Another Tim Story quote. Tim, thank you because this is what you taught me. A miracle is a supernatural intervention of God into the natural affairs of men. Think about that. A miracle is a supernatural intervention of God into the natural affairs of men. So, how many minutes do I have left? Ten minutes left. Okay, this is going to be a great story. Um, I am going to tell you something that happened last November. It's hysterical. You guys will get a big kick out of this. Um, but I love Jesus so much, and I love the fact that he did this. Um, Alan, who I went to Sunday school with, and Charles Norman, and we used to hang out at the Norman family, um, as I explained before. Well, Alan, he um, contacted me, and he wanted to know if I'd ever seen the Beatles live. And I'm thinking, hmm, that's... No, he, he wrote, have you ever seen the Beatles live? Have you ever seen Beatles Love? And I thought it was a text typo. And so I said right back and I said, no, I've never seen the Beatles live, but my dad has. And the closest I've been is the Three Stooges. And what happened was when the Beatles first put their feet down on U.S. soil, my dad was working for my grandfather's company, Bergeson Electric. And my dad was out on the runway fixing the lights. And all of a sudden, there are these wooden barriers. And a private jet pulls in. A stretch limousine pulls in. And out there's my dad. So the news crew grabs my dad. And as he grabs my dad, my dad is there when, my dad is there when the Beatles come off the airplane and step foot on US soil for the first time. So that was what that's what was funny is because I thought he's asked me if I saw the Beatles live. But I have to tell you a story because last November I went to a celebrity wedding. Um, I was asked I had I had not seen Alan for 35 years and what I kept saying is, Jesus, let Alan see the way you move in signs and wonders in my life. I want him to see this. But you have to understand something. Alan and I have known each other for so many years that every time he said he'd pray, who should I take to this event? Because I don't want to take anybody that's going to be going around taking selfies of all the celebrities. And he said, Sherry, your name kept popping up. And I said, okay. All expenses paid. Here I am. I get to the airport. I've got a brace on my leg. I've got a cane. And I'm in a wheelchair being wheeled to the flight. I'm sitting on the airplane. I look down and my wool coat is covered in white fur, like lint, like cat hair. And I'm like, it's like a cat had walked across me while I was sitting in the seat. And I'm like, where did this come from? So when I landed, Alan was waiting with the wheelchair, and we we were going to the event, and we get a taxi, and the taxi driver has no idea where he's going, so he takes us to the wrong location, and I kept telling Alan, do not let me forget to get a lint brush. Please don't let me forget to get a lint brush. And... As we're sitting waiting, Alan gets a hold of Uber, 
and the Uber driver comes up and while I'm sitting there with my little uh, knee brace on and my cane in my hand, I looked up toward heaven and I said, Jesus, I need a limp brush. I really need a limp brush. And up comes the Uber driver in a white van. He opens the door. He helps me in. He said, Sherry, here is your water. And he handled me a bottle of water. And he reached down and he said, and here is your lint brush. I'm like, no way. I was so excited. I'm like, see, Alan, I told you, Jesus works in signs and wonders. And I said, Lord, a lint brush? What's significant about this lint brush that you would use this as the miracle? And he said, Cherry, think about it for a minute. You wanted Alan to see. And how do we have faith with a mustard seed? We have faith as a child. So how simple, how simple is this that God would say, I'm going to use a lint brush to show my kids that even down to the tiniest bit of dirt, that's how much he cares for us. You've got needs, he cares for you. And then as, he, as I was in prayer and the Holy Spirit speaks to me, because the Bible says the sheep, my sheep hear my voice, and another they do not know. And so I know the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's not how I know to pray specifically for people. And so I looked at this lint brush, and he said, look at the lint brush. What, what's on it? And I said, oh, man, it's just all covered with all this different stuff. He goes, Sherry, that's sin. That's what sin does to us, to our hearts. He said, but Sherry, he said, I told you that your sin would be white as snow and that even though it's red as crimson, it shall be white as snow. So the message behind the lint brush is if you feel like you are far away from Jesus right now, that you have done too many things and he can't forgive you, I'm telling you right now that's a lie straight from the pit of hell because Jesus paid a price on that cross for you so that you could have a relationship with him for eternity. See this lint brush, all that sin and debris washed away. Do you know the Bible says as far as the east is from the west, he forgives us our sins and he remembers them no more. Don't beat yourself up. Jesus forgave you. Don't let Satan throw those back inside your head and say, oh, look what you did. Oh, yeah, you had to go to prison. Or, oh, you got drunk and you totaled your car. Or, or um, you lost your job because maybe you took some money. Now, these are just things that I'm throwing out. I'm not addressing anybody in particular. I'm just putting this out there. How are you going to be as a believer? Are you going to put... Like, oh, I can't be around that person because if I hang around that person and they've been to jail or they've been into drugs, then people are going to think I do, did it too. Uh-uh. I live in a neighborhood where I minister to people all the time. And I even had one woman that said, mm -mm, prayer's not going to work. It won't work. Her neck was stiff. And Jesus said, Sherry, I said, can I pray for you? She goes, no. She didn't want me praying for her. And I told you that I never had anybody tell me no, so you've got to know what's going to happen. I came home. I said, Lord, how do I reach her? He said, go get your Ben Gay. I said, I know your neck is stuck in this position, but I wanted to come over and put this on and just rub it out. So the whole time I'm rubbing her neck, I said, thank you, Holy Spirit, with fire. Heal her. Heal her. Let her feel your presence. Let her know just touch her from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet so she knows that she's been touched by God Almighty. See, that's what happened to the Uber driver. 
and I know I only have a few seconds left, when the Uber driver finally took us to the new place, the new location, he went to give me a hug. I put my hand on his head and I began to pray that he would feel the God of all creation in his body. And when he began to walk away from me, he started to walk and stumble like he was drunk. And he goes, what's happening to me? I said, looks like the day of Pentecost just hit you, my friend. I said, you are feeling the presence of God Almighty, your creator, and you're gonna feel this all the way home, and you're gonna feel this when you go to sleep at night, and you're gonna feel this in the morning, because God wants you to know that Jesus loves you, and he died for your sins. If you have never become a Christian, if you don't even know how to become a Christian, or if you've been a Christian and you've walked away and you've done your own thing, but God's been prompting you, would you pray with me right now? Would you just say a simple prayer? Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you are the Son of God. And I believe that by receiving you as my Savior, that you have forgiven my sins and that your spirit is now inside of me. Show me who you are. Make yourself real to me so that I can know you in a way that I have never ever known you before. And I thank you. Thank you for what you have done for me. Thank you for what you've done for me today. And thank you for what you are about to do for me in my future. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you right now, and I just pray for each and every person that's watched this program. Father, thank you that I'm just merely your vessel. Thank you for birthing Beyond Hollywood Live into my spirit so that they could hear the true message of the gospel, the rhema and the logos word, the spoken and written word of God. I thank you, Jesus, and I praise you. I praise you. I lift you on high, Lord because I would be nothing right now without you, Jesus. You chose me, I didn't choose you. You paid that price for me. And you knew me before I was born in my mother's womb. And I thank you for the rich heritage that I can pass on to those in need. See God, you've let me minister to celebrities and you've let me minister to those on the street that have been homeless because that is what you do. That is your heart. You don't segregate people and separate them. No, you love them right where they are. I ask right now, Jesus, before you send anybody else on an assignment, I always ask that you send me first. Send me, Lord, because I will go. Even in pain, even in cru on crutches, even in a wheelchair, even with a brace, I will go. Thank you guys for watching. I had a wonderful, wonderful time. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please share this with your friends. And for those that don't know the Lord and you've been trying to talk to them about Jesus and you know their heart's not there, remember it's not your job to convince them. That's the Holy Spirit's job. You love them. Take them to these part one and part two. Let them watch, let them listen, because you know what? That's gonna be your seed. And that's what we're gonna talk about next week. Part two is the fruit of our labor when we pray. Goodbye, have a blessed evening. It's been a pleasure.